You're listening to Resident Advisors Exchange. I'm Martha. Thank you for joining us. Carlos Hawthorne is our interviewer this week as we take a listen to their conversation with esteemed journalist and founder of the Outlaw Ocean Music Project, Ian Abina. I've always wanted to figure out how to um, leverage music to to do the things that I couldn't write well enough to accomplish, you know, tap the the, the subtler, um, more emotional, experiential elements of, of what I'm trying to chronicle. The Outlaw Ocean Music Project is based on Ian's book of investigative reporting, The Outlaw Ocean, a New York Times bestseller exploring lawlessness occurring at sea around the world, covering topics such as overfishing, trafficking, slavery and other human rights, labour and environmental abuse topics. While reporting at sea for more than five years, Abina built a library of field recordings, a diverse array of textured and rhythmic sounds. 400 different artists from over 60 countries, including names like Apple Blim, Fish Go Deep and Locked Groove, have used this sound archive and inspiration from the book to create music. As you're about to hear, Ian spoke to Carlos about the true cost of investigative journalism, the records that have the power to transport him back to stories he's worked on, and all about the Outlaw Ocean Music Project. I hope that you have a wonderful listen to Ian Abina on RA's Exchange. Yeah, I want to welcome you to the exchange, Ian Urbina. You know, we usually uh, interview sort of players in the electronic music scene. Um, it's rare that we have a uh, esteemed uh, journalist and author on the show. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to this chat. I guess I guess start by introducing yourself a little bit. Sure. My name is Ian Urbina, and um, I'm a journalist based in Washington, D.C., and I work on um, human rights, labor, and environmental abuses at sea around the world. And um, I run a nonprofit journalism organization that produces these stories, and it's called The Outlaw Ocean Project. Yeah, I've been reading your book, uh, The Outlaw Ocean. And one thing I was sort of very struck by, I guess, the sort of defining uh, message just is just how separate this world uh, this world of the ocean is from this, from from you know, the world of land that we that we inhabit, and how you know it abides by its own laws and, and codes and ethics. And I, I was just, yeah, as I was reading it, it struck me. I was just wondering, sort of, you know, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, I wondered how the last eighteen months had had affected that whole uh, world. If, if um, you know, if the virus itself had sort of halted industry in the way it has on land, and if. Um, and also, if you know, um, the past eighteen months has seen a lot of radical change in terms of you know racial justice, um, LGBTQ rights, uh, things like that. And I wondered if any of that sort of filters through to to the ocean, or if you have a sort of sense for how the world, how the pandemic has shaped that whole that whole sphere. The pandemic had a distinct impact on this space. Um, uh, to the to the extent that you think of the space from an environmental perspective, obviously the foremost overarching environmental concern of our time is climate change, and you know, um, COVID I think slowed the entire planet down, and th- there was a silver lining in that in terms of carbon emissions, right? You know, um, just sort of products move slower and less, and people traveled less, and and um, therefore overall carbon dumping um, decreased and and that is um, a good thing. Uh, um, In terms of the people out there, COVID um, intensified what had previously been a pretty severe, chronic, widespread, long running problem of uh, abandonment of uh, crew. And so this is this situation where you know, the, you know, workers on fishing vessels or merchant marine that carry stuff, you know, oil or iPhones or what have you, um, sometimes are just stranded out on these ships. They might be anchored 50 miles from shore or 50 meters from shore or 500 me- you know, miles from shore. But uh, for whatever reason, the ship can't um, 
continue on its way. Maybe the owner uh, stopped answering calls or there's some insurance issue or, or the ship breaks down and there's no funds to fix it. But, you know, um, the guys, and this is a mostly male world uh, on board, um, have, you know, no funds to get off the ship. They don't have immigration papers to disembark. They don't have means, uh, you know, usually political means to, you know, pressure the company or, or the governments to help them out. And it's a pretty serious problem. And COVID just made that so much worse because, you know, everything um, shut down and ports became even more strict about um, uh, folks uh, disembarking, uh, be they crew or whomever. Uh, and so there were just really a lot of intense cases of abandonment and seafarers being stuck in various places around the world. Sometimes these get pretty dire, you know, they have no food, they have no water, they have no, you know, minutes on their phone to communicate with their family. They don't even speak maybe the language of the local port. Um, and um, so that was something that really um, spiked uh, hugely during COVID. With regard to BLM and, you know, kind of um, racial uh, uh, justice issues, you know, um, I don't know that I've seen uh, many ways in which those issues have permeated this workforce. Um, I, I, I do, I mean, this may be a stretch, but I do think that, um, uh, what what re the the reckoning that that the last you know twenty months have uh, forced upon us to really confront some of these um, core justice issues um, at root you know might be boiled down to um, a concern and awareness of um, people that are uh, otherwise um, uh, voiceless or overlooked or disempowered uh, and the sort of subtle, uh, ubiquitous kind of um, uh, systemic uh, ways in which uh, developed societies um, reinforce uh, that kind of subjugation. You know, um, uh, I, I do think that at some fundamental level is the undercurrent of these movements. And that is certainly relevant for this workforce because uh, if ever there was a um, demographic that is voiceless and invisible and, you know, generally these crews are trafficked workers, they're from the developing world, um, uh, uh, they're brown, uh, brown and black largely, uh, um, and they are therefore some of the, the most vulnerable uh, workers on the planet. Um, and so sort of uh, to the degree that uh, I think everyone is, uh, and institutions include, you know, companies and governments and individuals are all thinking more about those things. I think that has real relevance to um, uh, taking a look at, at these workers. And I mean, I guess that was sort of what a key driving force behind, behind the project as a whole. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I, you know, been doing, I was at the New York times for 17 years doing, uh, investigative projects. And I didn't know at the time it wasn't a forward looking decision, but in retrospect, I see that a lot of the things that most interest me are these sorts of issues and sort of invisible, um, demographics. And, and yeah, so this, this line of reporting almost anthropologically struck me as, um, unusually rich in the sense that there's, you know, 50 million people work out there and um, the amount of stories that you hear about them or from them are, are, you know, is rare relative to other kinds of, you know, coal workers or truck drivers or sex workers or, you know, um, uh, you know, um, other workforces um, you might hear from, but, but this is a workforce that's huge. And, you know, 80% of the products we consume comes by way of ships, but, uh, you know, there are very few stories out there about what's going on, um, uh, in this space and with these people. Um, you know, we are a music magazine and, um, you sort of mentioned it, uh, at the start, but you also have, um, the ocean, the ocean outlaw music project, which is, um, well, I guess you can explain what it is. Um, yeah, just just take it away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so the Owl Ocean Music Project is uh, in some ways this weird 
experiment that had several goals. One was um, to take the characters and the urgent concerns and the narrative that was embodied in the journalism itself and um, convert that, convert the, the emotion quite especially um, within that reporting um, into some other language. And the, uh, so from words to music, right? So um, if you think of a journalist as a storyteller and you think of a musician as a storyteller sometimes, um, then the, the creative experiment here was um, let's recruit musicians to help us tell these stories in a different way in their own language and attempt to tap things that I struggle to do, you know, I struggle to represent. So emotions, for example, are a very hard thing to do a good job by when your, your tools are words or even images, you know, um, musicians, on the other hand, I think are masters at, at evoking emotion. And so my thought was, um, let's recruit them, see if musicians, be they hip hop, electronic, classical, whatever, um, could read the material, get inspired by it, hopefully, and then make a five track album um, that tries to sort of um, render uh, uh, what they found most compelling. The second, so that was a creative experiment. The second experiment was, um, how do I get my 17 year old son to pay attention to what I do? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he won't read the New Yorker, or the New York Times or any, any place where I write. Um, he consumes a lot of information. He's a smart kid. He's, uh, you know, he's up on the news, but he gets it from other platforms and other sources, including, you know, TikTok and YouTube and, 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 and um, so Facebook and, and Spotify. And so I thought like, okay, if I want to do a better job at reaching the 17 year olds of the worlds, the 25 year olds of the worlds, the, the 12 year olds of the worlds, like um, be they in Taipei or Caracas or Amsterdam, like how can I get them to them? And I thought, well, why don't we go to their watering holes? And one of their watering holes is music, you know, music platforms are consuming a lot. Um, and um, so the sort of innovation and distribution goal of the music project was to get at a different demographic of consumers with these stories, to enter them in a different way, to push this metaphor too much, like rather than going through their eyes to their head, which is how a written story affects you, go through their ears to their heart, right? Which is how music affects you. And so get at them a different way, get it a different demographic. And then the last the kind of goal, so that was innovation and distribution and accessing different folks. And then the third goal was, um, you know, if, if a tier one out news outlet or Spiegel or BBC, the New Yorker pays eight, 10 K, you know, $10,000 for a story that takes you know, nine months to a year to produce. And that story costs $120,000 to produce. This is a losing proposition. This is why long form international investigative journalism is just a dying thing because it's just so damn expensive. And so like, how do we make a different model here that is more financially sustainable? And um, so the third goal is a sort of entrepreneurial nonprofit model that hopefully kind of borrows from the generosity uh, of musicians and basically recruits them to make music. They keep 50% of any revenue made on the music and the other 50% goes um, into a nonprofit that's 100% spent on producing more stories. And the, the hope was that this financial model might help bridge the gap between, you know, in, in the economic gap of doing this kind of reporting. And so those were the three main ambitions of, uh, of the project. Music yeah, thank you. There's so much to unpack there. I mean, it's a really, yeah, really beautiful uh, project. And I mean, I guess I'm really curious about where you first had the idea and, and you know, the, a lot of the material, um, you know, a lot of the material that inspires the musicians is either field recordings of, of, of you know, the ocean and your time on boats, et cetera. And also, um, you know, voice notes that you've recorded about um, things you're seeing, I guess, you know, aspects of your reporting. Um, yeah, I guess just talk, me, talk to me about the field recordings aspect, but also just at what point did you think, I want to repackage this in a different way? I want this message to kind of reach new avenues. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and I'm terrible about mixing metaphors, so I will live up to that, you know, <laughs> problem. But, um, you know, if, if you think of a musician almost as a elite chef, you know, um, my thought was, well, if they're going to make a, 
a soundtrack to this book, right? A soundtrack to this story, then wouldn't it be even neater if they could pull as that chef put, could pull from an ingredient rack, a spices rack that actually derives from the reporting itself. So we, we built, we spent, you know, half a year building this huge archive, you know, searchable archive of uh, what, what some might call found sound, right? But this was um, sounds that are stripped from the actual footage um, at sea, five, six years of footage uh, reporting at sea. And the, and the stuff is weird, you know, and diverse machine gun fire in Somalia, you know, chanting Cambodian deckhands on the South China Sea, radio transmissions near Taiwan from a captain to another ship, you know, Scottish fishermen cursing out, you know, Greenpeace advocates um, telling them to get the fuck away from their ship, you know, like <laughs> just really interesting, like, you know, some of it ha is prose, you know, Secretary of State John Kerry at the UN talking about one of the stories and, and, and sea slavery, et cetera. And so some of it's prose, it has words and others is just textured rhythmic sound, you know, spinning winches and chanting. And, and we sort of put this at the disposal of the musicians and say, hey, look, you're the chef, you make the thing you wanna make, but I'm gonna equip you with a bunch of these authentic ingredients out from the field and mix them in if you want, you know, wherever, however, as much as little. And um, uh, that will help make the thing that you produce even more authentically tied to the reporting. And, you know, the, the, the musicians are just, you know, the best of them, and that's a lot of them, um, are just dazzlingly creative. And um, I just am, you know, kind of blown away anew um, by, with each album, by what they do with it, slicing them up and, you know, kind of putting them in odd places and then really leaning into going through the archive and finding the, the just perfect speck of sound um, that makes that denouement in the song or that break or that closer just just perfect. Um, so that's one of the things that they do. And then your other question was sort of where it all came from. I mean, the, the notion of using music in a journalistic way had, had has been something that's um, kind of haunted me for a long time. You know, I've, I've, I've always wanted to figure out how to um, uh, leverage music to, to do the things that I couldn't write well enough to accomplish, you know, tap the, the, the subtler, um, like I say, more emotional, um, experiential elements of, of what I'm trying to chronicle. And, um, you know, and I, I used to play this game with my son, called the imagination game where um, it's kind of like a writing essay without a writing exercise without writing. He, he, and you know, he was like eight or nine and his friends would be in the back car and I'd be driving them to some park or whatever. And I'd, I'd say, okay, we're going to play the imagination game. I'm going to put on a song. Um, it has no words. It's dramatic. I'm going to play it up, you know, 15 seconds up to the break maybe. And then I'm going to turn it off. And each of you have 10 seconds to think about what is the scene that goes with that song, you know, with that part of the song you just heard and create something in your head. And then you need to tell everyone else what's happening in that scene based on the song. So it's sort of like reverse engineering of the song to the story. And it sort of stokes their creativity. And it was amazing. You know, my son was always like, there are ninjas always in every one of his story. And, and <laughs> Michaela, the girl always had like something having to do with like mountaintops and helicopters. And, but like the, the thought there that sort of bubbled up from the fun of the song was the narrative potential that's embedded within music, even without words and how just the very shape of music can cause your brain to start building a story that seems in your own imagination to correspond with what you're hearing. And that just sort of, that interesting cognitive experiment like stuck with me as I reported. And that, that was one of the kernel um, itches that um, I needed to scratch and, and sort of motivated me to build a music project. I mean, you're speaking as a as a real music fan, I can hear, um, and I wonder just what role music plays in your life as a reporter. Um, yeah, I mean, how does it accompany what you do in that respect? I mean, I there are two big. Well, I have lots of regrets, but two of my biggest regrets are that I'm not better um, at language 
and learning languages and I don't speak more languages or even the ones I know I don't speak well. Um, and then, and, and music as, a, as one of the languages one can learn. Like I don't play any instruments. I consume huge amounts of music. It is one of my favorite things to do is to, I sooner listen to music than I watch TV, you know, um, or listen to radio. Uh, I, I, I don't actually listen to pod. Sorry. Um, I don't actually listen to podcasts that often um, or radio. I do listen to a lot of music. So I have this deep um, admiration for what musicians do. And, and I'm a real addict. Um, uh, and, it, and it's all over the place in terms of the type. Um, uh, but um, as it specifically pertains to journalism, you know, um, uh, th there, there was sort of the music project is a, is a child of, of several parents. And one of the parents was the imagination game with my kids. Another parent um, was this habit I got into, especially while reporting the Owl Ocean and at sea, where at the end of the day, when I would try to, uh, while, while, while the events of the day were so fresh in my head, I would try to write up my notes. Um, and I would, think about specific scenes that struck me as really poignant or, or whatever, you know, worth capturing. And when, if they were, if they had a real heavy charge to them, you know, somber, scary, foreboding, um, uh, um, funny, uh, you know, sad, uh, poignant, whatever. Um, uh, I often would try to listen to, I have, you know, a playlist of, you know, Hans Zimmer and Max Richter and a lot of like soundtrack type music that I use as my own kind of poor man's Adderall to focus when I'm writing. <laughs> and like, I would go to that list and um, uh, I would listen to a whole bunch of those songs and try to figure out which one best captured what my sense of that moment felt like for them, whoever the them is, or me. And I would then in the notes write a song, you know, write the name of that song for that little anecdote or that scene, right? And three months later, when I had to sit down and write the piece for the time, New York Times or, or write the chapter in the book or what have you, I would look back at the notes and then I would see the song, I'd put on the song and then I'd start building it. And it was incredibly helpful. Like the mnemonic potential um, to store that emotional memory was like really cool uh, and, and, and useful. And that was another parent of the Owl Ocean Music Project, the realization that like, you know, there's something here in this music that, that connects to storytelling and, and I should try to figure out a way to tap into it. Wow, that's such a neat, neat trick. I'm going to <laughs> have to steal that one. Um, yeah, I mean, how did you go about choosing the artists for the project? I, I listened to a lot of rap. I, I grew up listening to hip hop and my initial ambition was, and I was a huge, huge, and still am a huge fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton in terms of what it did with rap and, and also an academic treatise and, and sort of like, and so my initial thought was like, I want to do a Hamilton style rap album based on the book. And this was, you know, a long time ago when I very first started this, and so I talked, I, I reached out to a bunch of, you know, I'm an old guy. I'm, you know, I, I was, you know, my, the, the, the names I'm about to cite you will, will, it will date me. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, I reached out to some of my heroes, Chuck, Chuck D from Public Enemy and uh, Lupe Fiasco and, you know, some, some, um, some folks that I really thought had really interesting politics and, and would, would do wonders to, these stories. And I actually, you know, met with these guys and had talked to them, but the economics of recruiting them uh, um, to, to do this were unsustainable. You know, I couldn't uh, bring the capital that I would need to do that. And, and I just, anyway, so then I pivoted um, to a different model where I thought, why don't I go toward musicians that can, that don't need so much overhead. They don't need so many other people, you know, involved. They can make something on their Mac, you know, in their basement um, in a price efficient way, if I can inspire them to do so and to be so generous. And so I pivoted initially to electronic um, music of which I listen to a lot as well. And that actually, that pivot was game changing. Um, and I then um, started with my own Spotify um, 
lists and went after the artists that um, were on my own Spotify list. And, you know, it's hard. You got to figure out how to get to them and, you know, how to contact them and how to get, oftentimes they have bouncers, you know, three layers of bouncers before you can even <laughs> talk to the musician. And it's just like, you know, so you have to do this on scale because for every 10 artists you reach out to, you might get to two, you know? Um, and so if you're going to, if you're, if you're going to do this, like I wanted to do it, which is global, huge, you know, inclusive, not exclusive, not, you know, um, then, then I need to find a way to reach out to a lot of artists. So I just started using, you know, um, the suggestive algorithm of Spotify and other platforms. If you like this guy, you might try this guy. Then I'd listen to that second guy or, or gal and, um, say, okay, do I like this sound? And, and are there any barriers that might be challenging because they, um, you know, I don't know, their style or their use of prose or whatever might not really work. And so I'd sort of go through a vetting process. Are they big enough <clears throat> to, for us to not lose a lot of money? Because we, anyway, so I would, I would go through this vetting process and then we had a whole system for like figuring out how to, find and reach out to musicians and 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 yeah that's how we began recruiting and now we have over 500 musicians from 60 countries you know um uh participate you know each making their own album and every the first friday of every month we put out a new batch of albums and you know we're trying to double the size of the project you know ideally in the next 24 months i.e the next two years we'll um start focusing on the global South and, and really kind of try to find a way to recruit musicians from uh, everywhere in the world that that's uh, most vulnerable to the kinds of abuses that we cover and see if we can get those kinds of musicians looped in, um, in a, in a price efficient way. Cause a lot of them don't uh, have huge followings and, and, and therefore we're, we have no chance of really making any money on the, music but we have to put in a good amount of money to get the thing made and seen so playing with that yeah it's fascinating i mean it's it's fascinating that um you could ask as you say what five, five over 500 artists to sort of um you know take inspiration from the same source you know this the ocean, the ocean outlaw book and you know you could do it i'm sure infinitely and they would all come back with something different and sort of mm -hmm. fresh and um yeah that must be i mean yeah every time you hear a sort of new submission it must be really invigorating i mean what mm. um we should probably mention just some of the sort of more um artists more in the resident advisor world people like apple blim steve rahmad um kmru uh, sinti um you know there are plenty more but i was um brick wade i was just listening to rick wade's uh album um just before speaking to you like just sort of really pumping detroit house um <laughs> it's just uh yeah excellent and apple blim sort of you know doing his thing um yeah i mean it's, it's yeah it's a really really beautiful project what um yeah, one hour struck by one artist. I think a, a video I was watching uh, sort of promoting the project. One artist, Cromonichi, described the music as musical activism. So mm -hmm. um, sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, what you were saying about, you know, finding another avenue uh, in a journalistic sense, but also for the artists themselves, it's a way of um, sort of giving back and spreading their message in a different way. And, 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 mm -hmm. and yeah, I thought that was really powerful. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, one of the things I did find quite especially with the electronic artists and, and sort of the older ones was that, um, and this is no disrespect to electronic, I consume a lot of electronic, but um, I do think a lot of those musicians seemed um, uh, excited to have an opportunity to work on something that was uh, intellectually challenging you know and, and and that came with a certain amount of kind of um political geopolitical social cargo that you know um i don't know that um they were normally working with kind of weighty subjects you know um tied to electronic and 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 that we together had found this way to to make their craft and their genre relevant to things like you know 
slavery and and dumping and climate change and these sorts of things. Um, I, I sent when I when I would de, you know when I would after action report with the musicians after the album came out and and I asked them to tell me candidly why they decided to be so generous and 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 do this with me. A lot of them would say, "I'm always." It was just a, a really exciting chance to do something that that stimulated my brain in a different way than I normally get to work in, in as a musician or or as a musician in this specific genre. Absolutely. I mean, do you do you sort of jump on? What's the process like with your typical artist? Are you jumping on calls to sort of explain the situation? Is it all over email? How sort of face to face and interactive is it? It varies. I mean, um, it, a lot of it is email and, and, and you, usually there's a call on the front end. Um, hey, you know, it starts with, uh, hey, don't, you know, this isn't spam. Please just hear me out, you know, kind of email. <laughs> like, could you, could you just, would you be willing to read one email from me that explains this crazy idea I have? And then um, some say, yeah, sure, whatever. So, so then I hit them with the, hey, I got this project and here's, Here's what it aims to do and its mission. And here are its downsides for you financially, you know, like just really lay it out straight uh, to them. But I think here's why I think it's cool, et cetera. And then some are like, huh, that's interesting. And some are like, hell yeah, I'm down. Like uh, sign me up. And we send them a contract and off they go, right? Uh, others are like, this is really cool. Let's hop on the phone. And I just want to talk through some things. And then we do a, a call and, you know, invariably, I think the overwhelming majority of those calls result in folks saying, yeah, I'm down with it, you know, like once they, but uh, then we sign, a, get them sign a contract, they decide the timetable, like what works for you with your other releases and just your workload and family life and whatever, how many tracks you want to do, et cetera. Um, and we sort of have them set the pacing. And then, I, you know, I'm very clear about the aesthetics are yours. Like you decide the aesthetics. I'm not going to enter that kitchen unless you invite me in to taste the soup, you know, like, but other yeah. than that, this is your, your zone. The only thing that we have to, that I need to manage is um, the use of the imagery, you know, like I got to be really careful with that so that there are no inadvertent, you know, um, uh, missteps with, um, commercializing suffering you know we don't want to engage in misery porn we don't want to like inadvertently um use footage or use characters or or names or audio in a way that some people could find callous or exploitative or whatever so i am pretty persnickety about like no one touches the footage um uh unless i get to see how it's been used so we handle all the videos and the album art and everything like that uh for that reason but the music is yours the only other thing you know i'll say is like hey look if you're gonna have words in there we just gotta know what the words are and don't throw us some stuff that's like you know that has no connection to this like don't pull something off the shelf that you wrote seven years ago, even before you heard this and sort of pass it off as outlaw ocean stuff. I really need you to genuinely engage with this stuff. And again, not a once have I had someone, have I run into problems with that, but we, so, but then they usually disappear and I don't hear from them until T minus, Oh, you know, a week to when the stuff is due and they're like, Hey, where do I send it? I've got, I ended up doing, you know, double the number of tracks or whatever. And they send it in and, and, you know, then we sort of go into the next stage of like, okay, cool. You know, here's the date that we can turn this around mastering, mixing album art, video, et cetera. Here are a couple of dates for release. Any of those work for you? Yeah. And then great. Okay. We need all this information from you so that we can monetize the music and market it and pitch it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so that, those are the steps. Nice. I mean, you describe the music uh, as a soundtrack to the hook, and I think, you know, that works really nicely. Um, but of course, yeah, I guess the next sort of step in the project um, is is this deal with Netflix and Leonardo DiCaprio, is that right? Um, this, yeah, feature film and documentary series. It's pretty separate. So, so a couple of things there. One, we always have to be really careful about mentioning that because you mentioned the word soundtrack, and then two paragraphs later you mentioned DiCaprio and Netflix and people connect the two right. and the music here is not connected to that production largely because 
Netflix is its own, it's like China, you know, it's like its own country and it, and it has its own laws and its own, you know, um, and so th they're going to soundtrack their stuff as they want to soundtrack, but they've told me anyway, well, two things. One, we've, we're still with DiCaprio and his firm, his company um, are still, uh, they still own the option and they're still, but they have moved this IP over from Netflix to Apple. And um, so where he goes, the option on the book goes with him. Um, and I, I'm agnostic as to, you know, who, who runs it. I just want it to be done well. Um, so we're no longer with Netflix. It's, it's, but anyway, but um, the music project is kind of um, way upstream, you know, that, that whole project is going to take years to produce because they're following up, me and my team out on ongoing stories, not just the book. Okay. And so, um, so that's like down the road. Now, might whoever puts whatever it is out want to tap into the trove of music that we already built? Yeah, possibly. But like, I'm always really, really adamant to musicians don't plan or assume or depend on that because the chances are slim. They'll probably just like use one of their in-house people and that'll be that. We're going to build this for its own sake, get it seen on its own accord um, so, uh, that, that's one, um, difference. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess also, I mean, potentially you'd have the capital to, to attract the sort of bigger fish in the, uh, in the music world. I mean, it'd be, I guess it'd be a shame not to take advantage of that, but I'm sure there's all sorts of complications around that. Yeah. I mean, it's just not my decision. You know, they don't even let me in those rooms, you know, it's just like, <laughs> you just keep doing your thing. We'll, we'll handle the making of this. Um, and when it comes to how they render me or if they're going to come with me embedded on my stories and my reporting, I have a lot of control, but when it comes to like how they score the stuff they make, I have zero control. Um, sure. I have zero say. So I, mean, I do think that like when this stuff comes out the other side, um, uh, there'll be an echo chamber, hopefully there'll be an echo chamber type effect where, you know, um, people will jump on Google. Oh, DiCaprio's got this thing coming out. I wonder what that's about. And they Google it and suddenly they're over on the Owl Ocean Music Project. They don't know that they're kind of separate things. And so like the rising tide raises all ships metaphor applies here where anything that's bringing attention onto the reporting, I think will benefit all the different, you know, kind of offspring products from it. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, is, is, is the music project achieving its overall goal? Like, is this journalism getting into, into younger hands? Yeah. I mean, the, the financial goal isn't there yet. Like the, the, the making, you know, as you well know, making money on music is a tough go. Uh, and we're putting a fair amount into the music and so far we're not making that much coming out of it. Um, maybe we will uh, down the road, um, but the out, the distribution goal um, is killing. Like it, and that's in, in some ways the more important and really exciting thing. Like, so you take an article that normally would get, you know, 400,000, 500,000 readers, half a million readers. Um, and now we, we get, for two reasons, we get, you know, 10 times that audience. Um, one reason is that we don't publish the piece and give it exclusively to a singular venue. We, we self-fund it. Um, we cover our own costs. We take it to a tier one venue, you know, the New York or the New York Times, whatever. We say, here it is. You don't have to pay us for it because we covered all the costs anyway, because whatever you pay would be a pittance anyway. And, but <laughs> we're going to, we're going to maintain IP. We're going to hold copyright on it you run it for two weeks then we take it back and then we're going to translate it into eight different languages and we're going to publish it with 40 partners around the world their spiegel and nrc in netherlands and you know all over the place china latin america and in spanish and and um, we're going to get a much bigger global audience on this that's one reason the other reason is we're also going to run it through this music project and then my tech guys are going to watch the ip traffic and the ip traffic is really um, exciting, you know, because so you, you can on spot, you know, the, the platforms that have more data on who's listening to what and what do we know about those people. Spotify has pretty good data on the age and gender and geography and class and whatever of, of consumers. And so you could actually see not just who's listening to that song, but then 
that IP travels from there over to the website. And then they sit on a story for five, 10, 20 minutes. And you can see how much traffic is moving from the music platforms over onto the website and onto stories and which stories. And that's really, that's working really well. And that's where I think we actually do have a kind of cool, innovative thing for, you know, how to do journalism differently. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Um, I guess I want to switch a little bit and just talk um, more generally about the role of music at sea because I've, um, yeah, I'm just fascinated at sort of, what role it plays and I mean you touched a little bit on how how you interact with music and uh the ways you you listen to it but but yeah what about the sort of um you know the crews the captains um anyone really who 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 you encountered on these on these on these trips you know um the music was not Ships are weirdly hierarchical places. They make like the military look liberal, you know, in terms of, you know, it's like the, the captain isn't the boss, he's God. And, and like the, 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 the sort of cultural implications of that kind of a workplace or living space or community, whatever, um, are that there are sort of rigid norms about behavior. And one of those cultural norms, be it on merchant or fishing vessels that I found was the relationship to sound, um, be it talking or music or what have you. Like um, there are some places where you just, you know, you enter the bridge and you don't say anything unless you are kind of invited to say something by the officers. You're not even allowed to enter the bridge without asking permission before you enter the room, um, you know, uh, unless you're an officer. Uh, and um, so all of this me- is my theory, half-baked theory, as to why there's actually a striking lack of music on the vessels that I was on, of which they're, you know, talking dozens upon dozens of lots of different types, law enforcement, research, submarines, uh, merchant, a uh, lot of fishing. Um, so, you know, it was a rarity and it was typically only like funky ships like Sea Shepherd and Greenpeace where playing music anywhere um, would occur because the places where you'd play it would be in your room while I wasn't in people's rooms in the engine room while it's too noisy, in the galley, the lunch, you know, eating area, well, that just is not kosher because there's a mixed crowd and some people don't want to be hearing your music. In the kitchen, once in a while, um, because it's a set, smaller uh, um, space and, you know, there are only three chefs maybe and they know what each other likes. And so on the bridge, the only time I ever heard on the bridge was the night shift, like two in the morning, there are only two people there. They agree on what, music to play they put it on they put it on low you know like but everywhere else on the ship outside it's too noisy you know like so everywhere else on the ship um was surprisingly void of music now one place where there's really interesting use of music of a sort is chanting of deckhands on under mechanized ships so like on the south china sea which is a you know bloated you know kind of pre-modern you know old school fishing vessels big, you know, 50 crew, uh, all trafficked. Um, th- those guys are pulling, you know, 10 ton nets and you can't pull a 10 ton net even with 30 guys, unless you're in synchronicity, right? So um, you guys have to be moving in a real rhythmic way to, ex- to, to bring that force collectively at the same moment in the same direction. The way they do that is they chant. And um, it's a really cool thing. It's kind of reminds me of like, you know, chain gangs and, and slave music. And, um, but there, um, but on, you know, that was one place where there was really interesting use of rhythmic sound music. Uh, but everywhere else, it was generally pretty verboten to have music playing. That's interesting. I mean, were the deckhands, do you, did you get a sense for what exactly they were chanting? Was it like, yeah, I mean, was it songs that they recognized? Was it just a, a rhythmic thing that they sort of created themselves? The latter, yeah. I I never got someone to translate for me their words, if they even were words. Um, But what what I did get told to me several times was that, no, it's just something kind of a homemade thing we made up. And, um, and, and you know, again, these a lot of these guys are 
kids, you know, like they're not anthropologists who are studying, you know, like what's the origin of this one? You know, someone just like introduces at some point and then they learn this, the, the beat of it. And, you know, that's, that's as much as they know. Sure. Sure. Um, so yeah. And for you, you listened while you're writing, but also sort of in private as a way of, um, I don't know, as a way of relaxing, as a way of escaping whatever potentially was happening, you know, whatever you were experiencing mm-hmm. or witnessing. Yeah, I, I um, yeah, I um, uh, kind of am an addict to some degree of, of to, to exercise and kind of need it um, uh uh, more than I like to admit, you know, to keep me grounded and ships are hard places to pull that off. Unless again, you're on a ship that's equipped as such. Um, but most of the fishing vessels I was on were not equipped as such, you know, <laughs> they, um, so you kind of have to find some little nook somewhere on the vessel where at the wee hours, perhaps um, you can do your own little makeshift workout of whatever sort, you know? And um, uh, so I would, scope out those nooks and kind of figure out when there's no one around there. And is that a safe spot for me to spend a half an hour trying to break a sweat? And, um, and that was one kind of religiously guarded um, pocket that I would um, steal away for myself. And, um, and, and a core part of the workout was listening to music while also um, doing my thing. So that was one place. And then again, writing, that was another ritualized thing. I get up real early real, um, each morning and I'd be in my room or I, again, some other spot on, on the deck where I wouldn't be distracted and I wouldn't be in the way. And I'd, I'd usually put on some headphones then too, to kind of get focused. Uh, but otherwise walking around the vessel or even sitting in spaces and observing, I wouldn't wear headphones just cause it seemed, um, disrespectful and and uh and um and under undermined the purpose of my being there which was to take in the scene yeah of course i mean you mentioned uh sort of the power of silence there and i'll just yeah just read a, a, a short line from the book which is silence is core to the way of life on ships and breaking it can be a serious crime um yeah, I guess it goes to what you were saying, but I, was there a sense of sort of polluting the power of the ocean and its noise? And, um, you know, sometimes I feel that way if I'm walking through nature, you know, I might, um, you know, my instinct is to put on some music and sometimes you think, actually, maybe I should just listen to what's happening around me. Like maybe that's the real, uh, you know, that's the real music. Is there, is there that sort of mm-hmm. respect for the, for the outside world? Yeah, th- exactly what you say strikes um, it is true to a, a tension that I always struggled with. Um, on the one hand, um, I kind of wanted to, when in Rome, do as Romans, you know, kind of, I wanted to really um, force myself to immerse. Um, on the other hand, you know, I had some, I had to look out for myself and, and, and also, be wise about what things I need um, for the long run to stay um, healthy, you know, from a mental health point of view. And, and, and music is one of those things and also stepping out of their world and, and returning to some degree to mine was actually something that had value as well. And so I always, in the beginning, when I first started this reporting, I went too far toward the former and was just like, I'm not bringing headphones. I'm not gonna listen to any music. And then, and then I was out there for a long time and I was just like, <laughs> really, you know, w- yeah, it wore me down. Uh, and I started feeling unhealthy and just kind of somber and, and just like, you know, and so I thought, okay, I gotta recalibrate this and think of a bit of a more balanced way to survive these ex- reporting experiences. I mean, are there are there any sort of electronic albums or pieces of music that really stick out from those years, or, or maybe maybe even pieces that you can't listen to again because they take you back mm. some some horrific <laughs> trip or experience? 
That's a good question. Um, um, and while we're talking, I'm pulling up my Spotify list um, <laughs> to, uh, to 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 answer it um, authentically. Um, I know where just to look. I mean, um, so where is this? So th- this song by Jeff Russo, "The Night of." So um, uh, it, it's it's a theme song to a show that I loved, but um, it's it's very stressful. Like it's, it's, it's this violin. The night of is about this terrible murder, you know? And um, yeah. And that song like um, really, really nailed it when it came to this one incident that happened in in Indonesia where we almost died, you know, and we almost got lit up by this Vietnamese coast guard vessel. And, the Vietnamese took hostages of the Indonesians and I was on their ship and the, Indone- on the Indonesian ship and the in- Indonesians took a bunch of air quotes here, hostages from the Vietnamese and there was a standoff and they both turned their guns on each other. And I thought, okay, this is it. You know, we're just going to get, and we were one fifth the size of the, uh, of the Vietnamese vessel. We were just going to get blown out of the water. And um, uh, it was super stressful um, uh, situation. And um, I had to get pulled in as sort of the, hostage negotiator and I, wow. and anyway as we we fled the scene because the vietnamese call, vietnamese called in a bunch of backup uh and so we made a run for it and in so doing the indonesian officers abandoned one of their guys who had been taken captive and was on the vietnamese ship and this fear and shame and and just this kind of um, embarrassment and a bunch of other things like just filled the bridge as we ran. And that look, you know, took, you know, four hours to, to get far enough away where we felt like, okay, we're out of range now. Um, and I remember just sort of soaking in the scene on the bridge and that song, um, uh, um, is what I, thought best captured it and still to and every time I hear that song I get the same sort of adrenaline kind of um tight chest feeling that I felt as we uh made a run for it um so uh so that's an example amazing um great I guess just to finish what's what's next for you I mean what's your next big uh big expedition hmm. um so I mean, the Owl Ocean Project metaphorically is kind of this grand, crazy, you know, to the edge of the planet expedition. Um, and it's um, uh, um, going well. I think story-wise, I just got back from um, a brutal, probably the most scary, dangerous, brutal reporting trip I've had in my career. In uh, This was in Libya. Um, with a team and um, some bad stuff happened, which I won't go into now, but uh, sure. there, which will be part of um, the story that will come out in the New Yorker and um, in some months. Uh, but um, that was a look at the um, uh, very serious human rights abuses happening in Libya, you know, war crimes um, and the complicity of the EU quite specifically in funding the Libyan Coast Guard which is essentially there to prevent migrants from making it to Europe and what happens to those migrants um, when that EU funded effort succeeds, which it mostly does, um, is what we were investigating. And, and um, we got in some, some um, sticky situations while doing that reporting in Libya. Um, so that, that's what I'm focused on now is uh, building that doc film and, and that written story. And then um, later this year, I'll head to uh, Galapagos, Falkland, uh, Falkland Islands, Malvinas Islands, and uh, Uruguay to um, uh, do a really deep investigation of uh, the Chinese squid fleet. And uh, again, similar concerns about uh, human rights and environmental abuses uh, within that scene. Wow. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I love the book and it's been, it's been a real pleasure to chat to you. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me.
Thank you for listening to RA's Exchange with Ian Abina and Carlos Hawthorne. I will have a new episode for you next week. Until then, our full archive is available for you to take in. And if you find something you love, please leave us a review in Apple Podcasts as it helps get our stories to more ears.